And good morning, good morning. Happy Monday. This is your substitute teacher, Glenn Biddle, sitting in for Double J, who is doing the college visitation thing today in this virtual world that we live in. He'll be back tomorrow. So you are stuck with me today. And the history teacher that I am, I thought we should cover the atomic bomb as it is the 75th anniversary and the date just passed this past Thursday and Sunday when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the History Channel did a very good documentary last Sunday on the topic. Uh, I also have some clips to play you in the second and third segments today from an ABC News segment called The Century with the late Peter Jennings in the uh, show is called The Race, uh, for, yeah, obviously for the bomb between us and Germany and eventually Russia. So um, I'm also uh, joined today with Brian from KHNC, and uh, I think one of the first things we want to talk about are the you know current events. Obviously, we want to talk about uh, the the executive orders that President Trump signed over the weekend, four of them exactly, and uh, these are, are, are pretty uh, important, and uh, he actually beat the Democrats at their own game, it looks like, at least for now. Um, Brian, you with me? I am, Professor Glenn. Good morning. Hey, good morning. How's everything out in Colorado? Well, we get a break from the heat. We Well, when I say that, Arizona probably laughs at what we call heat, but uh, some some 90, upper 90 degree days, but at least we're getting a break from it today. So all, all's well here. We could use some rain, but uh, we'll just take what the good Lord sends us. And here's the amazing thing, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in Maryland. I'm at, literally at the beach. The waves are not too far away from me in the sand. I'm here in Maryland. Brian's in Colorado. The station's playing the, the uh, show from Colorado and Arizona, so we are covering the entire country with KHNC and and Patriot Trading Group. So that's pretty cool. Thank uh, you, so Al Gore, for the internet. Yes, thank you. He also invented the paperclip too. I heard, so that's pretty uh -oh. important. Um, oh, and before we get going, this is good because all these national days kind of mold together. <laughs> kind of funny in a way. It's National S'mores Day. It's National Lazy Day. And it's National Shapewear Day. So, Brian, if you eat too many s'mores and you're lazy, you're going to need shapewear to keep all those bulges under control inside of your pants or whatever. So uh, that's where we are in America right now. Think about how many the people bar. during the pandemic have gotten fat. Yeah, yeah. Right? But the, the only, yeah so uh, we, we don't want to talk about the, uh, the inner tube I got going on. So I've grown my hair. That's what I've done. I look like a hippie. I used to have a crew cut now i can almost get a ponytail out of it so that's where we are all right so we don't get too far off the rails here brian let's talk about these executive orders so the first one is uh, the unemployment and that's a 400 dollars stipend now 300 of it is covered by the federal government the other hundred dollars the states have to make up uh, which actually is very interesting because do the blue state governors go along with this and kick in the extra hundred or do they sit on their hands and look like fools so that was kind of the president playing their hand don't you think brian yeah, you gotta you gotta give them credit for uh, for for certain things like this. You know, it's it's not it's not like we've not been sold down the river many decades ago as far as the Federal Reserve and hidden inflation. But uh, was, yeah, well, but that's that leads question. to the next one. Yeah, that leads to the next executive order: the payroll tax deferment, and not a tax cut. All they're doing is just saying you don't have to pay your taxes, payroll taxes, for four months. You have to cover cover it in two, you know twenty twenty one. So that's a six point two percent pay increase in your check so let's say you make a thousand a week that's 60 extra bucks in your pocket not bad for a history teacher to come up with that right so uh, that's a good job man. i don't i can't even spell math anyhow but if you're if you're employed uh that's actually 12.4 percent because your employer matches 6.2 percent as well so once again that goes to fica and social security and we all we talked last week about how those programs are in deep trouble and to starve them of more money is a problem right brian yeah, it, it sure is. I mean, we, we call it money. It's it's. Uh, I, I'm trying to trying to train myself to use different, more correct terms that our callers, so, so intelligent callers, uh, remind us. But uh, currency, for sure, we know what real money is. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Right, FRNs, fraudulent reserve notes, fiat, meaning I yeah. say what it, it value is. Right. Then the third one is no evictions, but this is up to the federal agencies that actually handle the. Handle, so it's. Uh, so it's Ben Carson and, and the Federal Housing Association that they have to deal with with that with the evictions. Uh, that that's probably I mean as a landlord I I have some rental properties that that's a problem for me. I mean if you've got a person that's not paying their rent and you have to keep them in your house, that's killing you. But uh, I also see the other side of it of people that can't pay their rent 
where are they going to go? So I totally see that. And the last one is the student loan deferment. Um, so this one, uh, and, and, to, and this only applies to government-sponsored loans. So if you have a, a private bank loan for a uh, college court, college class, you know, you've got to pay that one back. But if it's a federal loan, you don't have to pay that back at this point. So once again, a deferment. So those are the executive orders. And I think a lot of this was to push the two sides together, um, see what happens with that. If they do pass something, then these executive orders all go away. They'll be null and void. Now, what's interesting is everybody wants to jump on Trump for these executive orders. But, hey, Brian, remember the executive order FDR passed that uh, confiscated gold? Now, I know there's some pushback on that, or the executive order where Nixon took us off the gold standard. How about that? So those yeah, talk are about, pretty, talk uh, about long, long-term long impacting uh, orders, right? Absolutely. And so this one, although this will definitely hit us in the rear end as far as the debt goes, um, no, not, a, not as big of an impact as, as taking the gold away from people and then also taking us off the gold standard in 71, which – why we have gold where it is today and just looking at gold right now gold is at two thousand forty five dollars an ounce it's up seventeen dollars silver is at twenty nine eleven up a dollar fifty seven so there was profit taking obviously last week but gold's bounced right back and it's it's still you know charging up that hill it, it is moving what do you think about oh well, we'll talk about that when we get back brian we're going to talk about the atomic bomb today as well obviously it's a important milestone 75th anniversary uh Glenn and Brian will be right back after the break. Stay tuned. And welcome back to the Patriot Radio News Hour. Here's how you get a hold of us. 800-951-0592 or on the internet, allamericangold.com. You can listen in at 1010 Family Values Radio out there in Phoenix or 1360 KHNC, the heart of northern Colorado. We are all over the place. Podcasts. Where else are we, Brian? Oh, my gosh. What streaming services are we on? We're on all of them, aren't we? Tune in. You know, that, that's, that's always a mystery, kind of a black hole to me. But, yeah, tune in is one of the big ones. Uh, Streama, I, I think it goes out to all of them if you search for a 1360 KHNC. And I know KXXT is, is, is out there as well. Right. And you can also go to our Facebook page. And uh, actually, the, the uh, YouTube video or the actual program for ABC News segment called The Century that's actually linked on to our Facebook page if you want to watch the whole segment. Um, so let's hit this special real quick. So this is a big one. Uh, this is this is pretty cool. And and quite frankly, we're giving the, we're giving the store away on this one. We have three quarter bags of dimes and one quarter bag of quarters. Now they are 90% silver. We call this utility silver. Some people call it junk silver. This stuff is good to have, fractional material, government hallmarked. It is good stuff to have in a collapse if you need to barter. Uh, my neighbor across the street buys his gas for a quarter. What he does is he takes his quarters to, to the local coin shop, trades them in, gets the Federal Reserve notes, goes and buys gas. He does a great job on that. With the, that the, this is why you have it, because a quarter today is a quarter, but a quarter back from 1964 is probably two fifty three dollars or more you know because actually more now because of the silver so it's well worth it so this special if the quarter bags are individually five thousand eight hundred and seventy five dollars delivered and here's the deal ladies and gentlemen that's only 18 cents basically over cost when when you're looking at 29 dollars silver so brian that is a sweet deal isn't it that is a for that uh, u.s government hallmark pre-1965 90 percent silver coinage uh, again, three quarter bags of dimes or one quarter bag of quarters for that uh, fifty-eight seventy-five price. But uh, yep. uh, doing what Patriots been doing for you know almost a quarter century now is is getting you in unbelievable deals to get you the most most weight of of real money metal for the uh, fewest number of fraudulent reserve notes. And, and here's how I like to store it. I like to store it in ammo cans, and you can stack a lot of silver in an ammo can, and they are heavy, uh, which is was the way to go. You know, with, uh, on our, our radio station out in Colorado, if you're close to the station, we give away a lot of ammo cans, and we just like, hey, stack that silver in there. So that's what you need to do. Or just go find it. If you have an ammo can at home, start putting all that silver there. And it's really fun. You can take that ammo can and with all that silver in it, just dump it out on your rug in your living room and just – Put, run your hands through it. You'll feel like a king with all that uh, all that silver. And you like boy, Scrooge, you had, like Scrooge McDuck swimming in it, right? Uh, yeah. If you had gold in there, that would be better, right? So, uh, all right. Yeah. So here's 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 our main topic today. So, as a history teacher, um, 
every year I like to do this story on on Kate on on uh, the Patriot Radio News Hour about why we dropped the bomb. You know what? You know why did we do that? We had the bombs. We could have done a demonstration. Uh, we could have done lots of things other than dropping them. Historically, everyone thinks that uh, we we dropped the bomb to make the Japanese come to the table uh, for for peace talks, but they wanted to surrender even before we dropped the atomic bombs. It was just that they had a lot of conditions to it, and uh, we we wanted unconditional surrender. And basically, their big sticking point was that the emperor had to stay in power. And I think we eventually agreed to that when MacArthur went in there and took over and started running the country again. But uh, for the most part. That's what happened. It was also used uh, apparently because uh, we figured it would cost over a million lives or more to, to invade the home islands because they were fighting ferociously. As closer we got in the island hopping campaign, closer to Japan, it was just brutal fights that we had to go through with the Japanese. They just would not surrender. In fact, when one one island, they literally jumped off a cliff and killed themselves rather than be captured. So it was just amazing. Um, uh, Bernice, could you play the first clip for us, please? The last year of the Pacific War was the killing year. The fighting dragged on for week after week at enormous cost in human life. The Japanese were unwilling to surrender despite their staggering losses. President Truman's military commanders had begun to discuss an invasion of the Japanese home islands, a chilling prospect for the tens of thousands of American soldiers being assembled in the Pacific. And it very much looked as if the closer we got to the Japanese home islands, the harder they would fight, even though they should have surrendered. So we were faced with the terrible dilemma that every punishing thing we could think of to do to convince them that the war was over and they had lost didn't seem to work. In the summer of 1945, on a small, flat Pacific island called Tinian, more than a thousand miles from Japan, the 509th Airborne Group arrived with 15 special B-29 bombers, each modified to deliver a single atomic bomb. With them came a small group of scientists from Los Alamos, now dressed in uniform. They had arrived on Tinian as the U.S. was conducting the deadliest bombing campaign of the war. American planes had dropped more than 300,000 tons of bombs on Japanese cities, burning them to the ground. One of the most devastating raids of the entire Pacific War took place on the night of March the 9th, 1945. American bombers burned 16 square miles of Tokyo. More than 100,000 men, women, and children were killed. Once you accept it, strategic terror bombing, it didn't make uh, any moral difference whether you did it with one bomb or 500. So there was no doubt the moral step had already been taken when they firebombed Tokyo. That was the demonstration that they were committed to s s bombing of civilians. And if you did it with regular fire bombs, then why not use nuclear bombs and do it more efficiently? By July, nearly the only cities left unbombed in Japan were the four which General Groves had taken off the Air Force target list. Kukura, Niigata, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima. General Groves wanted virgin targets so as to measure the true destructive power of the bomb. Okay, so that's our first clip, and it, we were already firebombing Japanese cities. And if you're familiar with Japanese cities, they were basically wood and paper. So the fire created its own wind and just raised, basically raised the city. It was terrible. And as that one scientist said, why not be more efficient instead of using 500 bombs, just use one bomb? And very matter-of-factly, as he said that. And, uh, you know, Brian, what do you think about that? I remember that in uh, my engineering college you know we had to do a little bit of humanities to i guess keep us keep us honest but uh, that was a topic that i remember we debated for uh, several weeks was should we should we not have and uh you know as young dumb students <laughs> you can imagine what the what the responses were 
and I imagine that a lot of your teachers probably at were either the older guys that that came out of that World War II era that were heck yeah we're going to drop it, or you're now your your people that have had hindsight on it and like wow that was a terrible thing we should, we should never should have done it. You know obviously that we can you know Monday morning quarterback that decision forever on whether it should have been done or not, but the fact of the matter is it was done. We were the only country to ever use an atomic bomb in, in anger. And it was quite devastating, even though the second bomb actually was not exactly on target. And these were just basically firecrackers compared to what we have today. Uh, Bernice, can you go ahead and play the second clip, please? The first bomb was called Little Boy. Early evening, we were just called and said, uh, we're going to go tomorrow. And we went in for a briefing and just sat there, sort of wide-eyed, listening to the uh, operations officer saying what we were going to do. I remember one thing he said, "Now, if you have problems, we have submarines here, here, and here to pick you up. Harold Agnew, then 24, and two other scientists flew in an escort bomber on the Hiroshima mission. The bomb was on board the Enola Gay, flown by Colonel Paul Tibbets. On August the 6th, at 2.45 in the morning, three B-29s took off from Tinian and headed for Hiroshima. It was only three weeks since the first atomic bomb had been tested in New Mexico. In the port city of Hiroshima, population 300,000, it was a warm, clear morning. A few people noticed the three silver planes that appeared overhead at 8.15 in the morning, but no one took cover. took these pictures from the window of his B-29, 25,000 feet above Hiroshima. Okay, so that is the second clip, and uh, when they've dropped the bomb, the bombs detonated over top of the city at about about a thousand feet. The reason they did that was to blast down to get the most extreme destruction that they could get with that bomb, and uh, yeah, both bombs did that. And uh, on the on the second bomb, when they when they went into Nagasaki or when they were going actually going to Kokura, but Kokura was clouded over, so they diverted to Nagasaki. And when they dropped the bomb, they were just a tad off. Now, when they say you know close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, it also counts in nuclear bombs as well, because that, whereas these were small nuclear bombs, think about this: the Beirut explosion, Brian, was one fifth that of Hiroshima, and it, everyone's seen the video of of that. Uh, explosion in Beirut, which was completely catastrophic for that downtown Beirut, just a shockwave. And that's where you get most of your problems. You get you get the blast, the heat, and then the radiation. And that's the big problem with the with the nuclear bomb is the, obviously the radiation, the after effects, but the heat and the blast are the most important things. There are, are literally people were vaporized uh, at ground zero. There are, their shadows were burned into concrete. That's how amazing this thing was as far as its destructive power. Uh, Did you Brian, say the explosion you last week was a fifth? One, one fifth that of Hiroshima. Which yep. <laughs> I didn't realize. Yeah. I, I mean, I saw the video. I know, knew it was significant. I didn't realize it was that powerful. Wow. Yeah. that that's. Uh, I just, just saw, pick, picked that up yesterday. It was one fifth. Now, obviously, the the uh, the, the heat and the and the black, I think the shock wave I think was the what they're talking about there. But yeah, okay. destruction. When you look at destruction, if you look at an aerial view of Beirut, that place is just just I mean wiped out. I mean just uh, it's crazy. Yeah, just how how it flattened it was. All right. So um, now here's the thing about 
the atomic bomb. When they dropped the bomb, and they, as soon as the bomb was released out of the airplane, they had to do a hard bank away because they weren't quite sure what the shockwave was going to do to the airplane. And when it hit the airplane, it rattled them pretty good. And you know they're trying to film everything, and and uh, and like you said, the the the, the um, cities were virgin targets. They had never been bombed before. They actually wanted to go in and basically take a before and after picture of what happened. One of the next clips in in that. Um, ABC News thing is where the scientists actually go in there, and uh, they're like, ah, "Yeah, I, I had no particular reaction. It it did what it did. You know, we 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 did our job." And the one scientist goes, "Yeah, we certainly made an impact." Uh, you think? <laughs> I mean, that's unbelievable, right? Uh, yeah, we did make an impact. It, it, I don't know who wrote this thing, but it said. It was a warm, hot day. Oh, oh, yeah, about to get about as hot as the, the surface of the sun for an instant when the bomb goes off. I mean, I, I, if I was an editor, I think I might have changed the wording of that a little bit. But you can actually go see the entire um, video um, on ABC News, The Century, called The Race. And it's on YouTube. It's also on our Facebook page on KHNC. You check that out. We'll be right back. It's halftime on a Monday. Stay tuned. And we're back. Welcome back to the Patriot Radio News Hour, 800-951-0592, allamericangold.com. And we are special today. This is a great one. We have three bag, quarter bags of dimes and one quarter bag of quarters, 9% silver. Get that uh, junk silver, utility silver, as we call it, $5,875 delivered. And that's basically only 18 cents over cost. That is a great deal. You cannot go wrong with that. And uh, Brian, are you still with us, or did you have to drop off? No, no, I'm still here, Glenn. But and what I'm still like here. Okay. And what sounds like an incredible deal is the the dimes. The three quarter bags of dimes are even even more incredible. There's only deal. two left. Oh, oh okay. two left. There you go. Okay, so two bags of dimes. Good. Well, that's that's. Well, good for us, and it can be good for you, too, if you're the next two people that call in and grab a quarter pack of dimes. You can snatch those up. That's that's a great deal. I mean, literally, when it's 18 cents over cost, that is a smoking hot deal. So that, you can't go wrong with that. You know, government hallmarked material, uh, great fractional material, great stuff to use for bartering, um, yep. just great stuff to have to hedge against inflation because, uh, as we say, it's, it's like bacon. You know, the bacon two or three years ago was like $3 a pound. Now it's 5 or $7 a pound. It's not like the bacon got any better. It's the same bacon. Yeah. It just takes you more Federal Reserve notes to buy that bacon. So basically that's what the silver's doing. The silver is, <laughs> is, a, is just acquiring value just because it's sitting there. So that's a great thing to have, right, Brian? Keep expanding that supply of fraudulent reserve notes and then let us buy less with it, right? Not not the way we things should work, is it? I mean, it's it's yeah. insane. It just makes no sense at all. And we were I would no, no, we kept Yeah, we, sorry, we Glenn, talked I mean, about they, the, uh, they educated out of us too. I mean, they've done a superb job if with the education system and just in general about educating out of the American system what what's what's real money, gold, gold and silver, honest money. I know. I make it a point whenever I'm and I'm doing my my unscientific study of of the coin shortage. Whenever I go to a place and they they give me some pennies back, uh, you know, I, my eyes are getting bad now. I'm like, I, I can tell the new one, the new pennies, obviously. But if it's an older looking one, I'll say, Hey, can you tell me what year that is? Why do you want to know? I'm like, Well, if it's an '82 or older, it's worth two cents because it's copper. Really? Why is that? I was like, because copper has value. This zinc penny does not. And uh, at that point, I think they all, all these millennials that are working behind the counters there start, maybe hopefully they're going through the, the cash drawer and, and uh, culling, you know, like, like people did back in the, uh, the you know, the, the late 70s, you know, when, uh, when, when all that happened, uh, well, even early to mid 70s, you, it was still relatively easy to find a silver quarter back then. And I know a lot of bank tellers were, were basically going through the, the, uh, the drawers and calling out all the silver. My dad was a school principal and at uh, the lunch money, he would go through the lunch money and pull out all the silver coins and he would obviously replace it with, with paper money. But I mean, that's how he got a lot of his silver money that their silver coinage was just going through the lunch money at school well you and, couple that uh, today yeah. glenn with you know i visited a couple establishments over the over the weekend uh with signs all over the place please have exact uh, exact currency because we can't we can't uh, make change 
I, I, this is nuts. I was at a, at a convenience store last night, and I got an ice cream sandwich. Now, I treated myself because I don't eat sugar much anymore. And so it was like a dollar seven. I don't know, like a dollar eighty four or whatever. And I had quarters in my hand, and and the guy said, "I can't give you change back." I'm like, "Would you like to donate your change?" I'm like, "No, I'm not donating my change." I'm like, "He's like, well, it's only a dollar." I'm like. But it's a dollar eighty four. He goes, No, just give me a dollar. I said, How about if I give you a dollar seventy five in quarters? No, just give me a dollar. This guy, I couldn't get through this guy's head that you know, a dollar seventy five is closer to a dollar eighty four than a dollar is. I'm like I said, Well, can I go back and get two a ice bit of a rounding error. Yeah, oh, it's a huge rounding error. You know, this guy should work for the government, right? And and doing the <laughs> oh unbelievable. But, but yeah, I don't know, there's like, there was that story several months ago where uh I don't know if it was an auditor somewhere was fired because he was uh he was correctly pointing out uh some of the accounting issues. I don't know if it was the defense department spending or where, but he uh he, he got himself uninvited from uh from helping keep track of things. Yeah, the Baltimore City auditor quit because they were telling her to kind of cook the books or whatever. So I'm not doing that. You know, I'll go to jail over that. You're not, you're not going to do it. So, all right. So we're going to get back to our uh, history lesson today on the atomic bomb. Now, everybody seems to think that all the top brass was on board with this. Now, obviously general Groves was on board. He was, this was his baby, the Manhattan project. And he, he was basically a very hard charging guy. He, he pushed those physicists to the point where, a lot of them rebelled against him at the very end. Once the you know VE day took place, they're like, well, we were just doing this because we thought the Germans were doing it. Obviously, if they don't have the bomb, then we don't need to make the bomb. He's like, no, it's, it, never, it was really to see that it couldn't be done. If, it, if we couldn't make it or if it was you know, physically, physics-wise, impossible to make the bomb, then no one could make the bomb. And when Germany dropped out, and they were the leaders at the time of, of physicists, the ones that hadn't come over here to the U.S., I mean, if, they, if we couldn't do it, obviously it couldn't be done. But anyway, at that point, it just becomes to make a bomb. And some of the physicists had problems with that. And I'm going to talk about a guy later on named Leo Zillard who tried to get to FDR to stop it, and he was kind of cut off at the pass for it. And, uh, but, uh, that, that's, that's, so the, obviously the bomb was ready to go. Now, one, an interesting thing was, I don't know if you've ever heard of the USS Indianapolis. This was the ship that took the bombs to Tinian. And what's interesting about that is it delivered the bombs and then a day out from Tinian, it was sunk by a Japanese submarine. And this, this, the, um, story about the Indianapolis and the crew that what they had to go through for two or three days in shark infested waters before they got some help was unbelievable. There's a, a, a book about it, about the Indianapolis. That I suggest you strongly uh, take, take a look at that book. It's pretty incredible. And I have an article here, um, Brian, that talks about military leaders who were kind of against this. I'm going to read a little bit from it. The top American military leaders who fought in World War II, much to the surprise of many who are not aware of the record, were quite clear that the atomic bomb was unnecessary, that Japan was on the verge of surrender, and for many, the destruction of large numbers of civilians was immoral. Most were also conservatives, not liberals. Admiral William Lee, Truman's chief of staff, wrote in his 1950 memoir, I was there that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. In being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. That's that's pretty powerful. The commanding Very. general of the U.S. Army Air Forces, Henry Hap Arnold, gave a strong indication of his views in a public statement 11, year, 11 days after Hiroshima, Hiroshima was attacked. Asked on August 17th by a New York Times reporter whether the atomic bomb caused Japan to surrender, Arnold said that the Japanese position was hopeless even before the first atomic bomb fell because the Japanese had lost control of their own air. It was a mistake. The scientists had this toy, and they wanted to try it out, and so they dropped it. This was Admiral William Bull Halsey. He's a you know, hero in World War II. Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, the commander-in-chief of, of the Pacific Fleet, stated in a public address at the well, – I'll read this when we get back. Some more on these leaders that we've all heard of. This is probably something you've never heard before. We're kind of, well, hey, we didn't need to use the bomb. And we'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned. And welcome back to the Patriot Radio News Hour, 800-951-0592, allamericangold.com. And as 
We only have one more silver dollar. Well, we only have one more quarter bag of those dimes left, so <laughs> hop on that. If you want that last bag of quarter bag of dimes, you better let your fingers do the walking, as the old uh, advertisement said. Was that the bell system, uh, Brian? Let your fingers do the walk. Oh, that's the yellow yeah. pages, isn't it? Yellow yeah, pages. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great. And we still have the quarter bag of silver. So uh, once again, $5,875 delivered for that. And once again, 18 cents over cost. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to get on this. This is incredible, incredible deal. So uh, obviously two people have uh, snatched up two of our quarter bags. We have one quarter bag of dimes left and a quarter bag of sil- or quarters. So hop on that. So, Brian, before the break, we were talking about the different uh, – you know, senior military officers that that were saying that the bomb wasn't necessary. The next person, here's a heavy hitter, General Dwight Eisenhower stated in his memoirs that when notified by the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, of the decision to use atomic weapons, he voiced to him my grave misgivings, first on the basis of my belief that Japan was already defeated and that dropping the bomb was completely unnecessary, and secondly, because I thought our country should avoid shocking world opinion by the use of a weapon whose employment was, I thought, no longer mandatory as a measure to save American lives. He later publicly declared it wasn't necessary to hit them with that awful thing. Even the famous Hawk Major General Curtis LeMay, the head of the 21st Bomber Command, went public a month after the bombing, telling the press that the atomic bomb had nothing to do with the end of the war at all. Uh, Quite interesting that Eisenhower, obviously, when he becomes president, had that uh, military-industrial complex speech, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Calling calling out the technocrats, I mean, that's, yeah, your one quote that you read uh, before the break about the scientists catching the blame, and, you know, I'd always... I'd always heard about the the military being the the pushers of it, but I think at the very very top, it's this this technocratic elite that we're still finding uh, pulling the strings in so many different avenues. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting ready to get into to that, and uh, you're exactly right. And and gosh, um, Eisenhower in the '50s, he was that was the height of the Cold War. I mean, he was yeah. he was in charge of all that too. So I mean. I'm, I'm glad he was actually he in know. charge because, yeah, he would definitely know, right? So yep. uh, as the article continues, the record is clear. From the perspective of an overwhelmingly number of key contemporary leaders in the U.S. military, the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was not a matter of military necessity. American intelligence had broken the Japanese codes, knew the Japanese government was trying to negotiate surrender through Moscow, and had long advised that the expected early August Russian declaration of war, along with assurances that Japan's emperor would be allowed to stay as a figurehead, would bring surrender long before the first step in November to a U.S. invasion could begin. Historians still do not have a definite, definitive answer to why the bombs were used, given that U.S. intelligence advised the war would likely end if Japan were given assurances regarding the emperor, and given that the U.S. military knew it would have to keep the emperor to help control occupied Japan. In any event, something else clearly seems to have been important. We knew that some of the Truman's closest advisors used the bomb as a diplomatic and not simple mat, simply a military weapon. And here's where Leo Szilard comes in. Secretary of State James Burns, for instance, believed that the use of atomic weapons would help the United States more strongly dominate the post-war era, according to Manhattan Project scientist Leo Szilard. Now, what's quite interesting about this Szilard guy was he was the guy that first came to the military and said, hey, we need to build this weapon because if we don't, the, the Germans will. And he got Einstein to do this and what's interesting to go to go to the to sci- to the military and what's interesting is here you have a bunch of scientists with very thick european accents saying that several pounds of an exotic metal can destroy a city and and he said we look like classic crackpots telling that to them and uh, you know and and here now the guy that said we need the bomb now is saying that we don't need the bomb and he meets with burns and burns is like hey you had the one guy that didn't want to use the bomb talking to the one guy that did want to use the bomb in the same room and that wasn't going to work so you know Zillard's concerns never reached Truman and that's when Truman was told to drop the bomb now well here's another cool well, clearly a chess move yeah Cle- oh clearly absolutely chess move with with the excuse of of, of J- the Japanese surrender but exactly and the, the other thing is um you know it's kind of almost like the end of the Indiana Jones movie when they when they have the Ark of the Covenant in the box yeah. and and they're like, hey, who's who's working on that? And they're like, oh, we have top men working on it, and like they're just top boxing it up, men. put it, you know, so with Lazard goes in there to talk, wheeling, who's, wheeling, who's, wheeling down the never ending uh, never ending yeah. warehouse full of crates, right, of, right. Of who knows what. So when Lazard goes in there, like who's dealing with the bomb? It's like top men are top men, 
not your concerned scientists. And uh, so a lot of the scientists resigned after that and uh, didn't want anything, but they'd already built the bomb. So it was, yeah. it was the first test of the bomb. <laughs> the scientists were actually taking bets on the, the explosive potential of the bomb. And one scientist was taking side bets that it would be so powerful that it would ignite the atmosphere and burn up the world. And the, now let's, the general now let's, growth. Let's, let's test that one. Yeah, that sounds like a brilliant. <laughs> let's see what this will do. And, and when they when they put the first bomb together, they were using masking tape, cardboard, you know, all sorts of things <laughs> to put this thing together. Uh, and we built two different types of bombs. We built a plutonium bomb and a uranium bomb because we wanted, you know, we wanted to see which one would That's would work the best. Yeah, right. And uh, it very very interesting how all this took place. And and you talk about heavy handed eminent domain i mean mm. general groves just bought up hundreds of thousands of acres in tennessee and washington and new mexico and created one of the largest buildings ever built to and you know how they always talk about the um the machines that the iranians have the centrifuges to create the uh the uranium well that's what we basically had in in uh in Tennessee, and we were using the power. The power of this thing actually came out of the Great Depression. You know, some of the, the TVA projects helped use the electric to to build the uh, the bomb, which is also very interesting too. About how how all the how we got out of the depression also helped build the bomb, which a lot of people don't know. So well, I remember reading about 15 years ago, Glenn, the, the Yucca Mountain uh, Nuclear Storage Facility. I think it's in is it Nevada, the Nevada Desert. Mm -hmm. They yep. studied it and all sorts of faults, and you know. I would say hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars spent on it. And I don't even know if any, any of the material end up being stored there. I'm, I would be a NIMBY person on that one, not in my backyard. Yeah. I would not want that stuff in my backyard. There's no nope. way. All right. So uh, when we come back, uh, I've, gosh, final segment. Man, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, not necessarily talking about a nuclear bomb is fun, but uh, just the fact we have Brian on is fun. And we'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, with the final segment. And we're selling some silver. One bag of dimes left. Get on it. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the Patriot Radio News Hour, 800-951-0592, allamericangold.com. We have one quarter bag of dimes left and one quarter bag of silver quarters, $5,875 delivered. And once again, 18 cents over cost. That is a smoking hot deal. Um, I have uh, this last article I'm going to read. It's just the atomic bomb by the numbers. It's, it's just a bunch of facts, and it's act some of them are, are interesting, especially the cost of what the Manhattan Project was. So uh, the number two, the number of atomic bombs dropped on Japan during World War II, 80,000 people who died instantly in Hiroshima, Japan, on August 6, 1945, when the first ever atomic bomb was used in war. The code name of the uranium-based bomb was called Little Boy. hundred and 92,020, the num total number of those killed in Hiroshima, combining those killed instantly and those killed from radiation and the other aftermath of the bomb. The revised total was released at a ceremony on the 50th anniversary of the bombing. Uh, the number three, the number of days between the first and second atomic bombs dropped on Japan on August 9, 1945. An implosion model plutonium bomb named Fat Man was detonated over Nagasaki. Uh, more than 70,000 number of people killed instantly in Nagasaki by the bomb. Uh, the number five number of days after the bombing of Nagasaki that Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's acceptance of the terms of the Potsdam Declaration and its unconditional surrender, bringing an end to World War II. Two, the number of possible targets for the second bombing, Nagasaki and Kakura. Nagasaki was chosen because of the weather. Kakura was, you know, clouded up, and uh, they just were off a little bit on Nagasaki. It probably would have been a higher death toll if they had hit it completely dead on. Uh, here's an interesting number, two billion. Now remember, a billion is a thousand million, so two thousand million dollars. The approximate cost of research and development of the atomic bomb by the United States called the Manhattan Project. Now we think about two billion dollars today, that's nothing, okay? But that was a lot of money back then. Okay, 130,000, the number of people employed by the Manhattan Project. And they were under strict security. They they were on them all the time to make sure they weren't talking out of. And now, the other problem with this was the Russians got their their uh, plans for the atomic bomb from us. Uh, their spies, the Rosenbergs in Los Alamos, which stinks. Uh, number three, research facility three research facilities involved in the development of the bombs: Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Tennessee; the Hanford site in Washington; and Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. 
uh, 17, these physicists would worked on the Manhattan Project who already were or would later become Nobel laureates in physics. 18,000 tons of TNT equaled in the blast from New Mexico test run on July 16, 1945. 1,800 feet, the distance above the ground that little boy detonated over Hiroshima after it was released from the B-29 bomber in Ola Gay. 9,700 pounds, the weight of the little boy atomic bomb. And 60,000 feet, the height of the mushroom cloud following the detonation of Fat Man over Nagasaki. So there's just some of the numbers there. Um, just uh, an amazing turn of events. Uh, we entered the atomic age after this. Uh, another interesting video, if you want to watch it, is called The Atomic Cafe. It's a uh, kind of a collection of all the different, um, I guess, videos that were made in the 1950s, the duck and cover, or how we thought we could survive a nuclear war in the 50s. And when you think you can survive a nuclear war, guess what? You just might be willing to start one. And I know that uh, uh, they wanted to use the bomb in Korea uh, to stop the, the uh, Chinese and the Koreans when they were attacking us. And that would have been crazy to escalate that. So... Well, thanks for listening today on a Monday. We're going to hop on that special quarter bags of dimes, one bag left, and a quarter bag of quarters, 5,875 delivered. It's been fun to be with you. The Professor Glenn, 800-951-0592. Joe will be back tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Same bat time, same bat channel tomorrow. Have a great day.